Hello and welcome to our software product line lecture. This is the seventh lecture and it will be about languages for features. So we will look at language extensions of existing languages that support features as first class citizen. The slides have been created by Timo Kehrer from the University of Bern and Elias Küter from the University of Magdeburg and I assisted him uh, with the slides and also this whole uh, course is mainly uh, architectured uh, by the three of us. Uh, this is a picture of the University of Ulm uh, where I'm located at and uh, if you want to see this beautiful campus just get in contact with us. Uh, so this lecture will be about languages for features. Uh, we've already seen other uh, topics in this course and we are in the middle of part two somehow and we already talked about the implementation in the previous two lectures. So this will be the third of three lectures on the implementation of features. So how can we implement, how can we realize the vision of software product lines on implementation level? So this will be the last one and there will be also a recap in the next uh, lecture when we want to compare all those languages with each other. So this uh, lecture will be divided into three parts. We will first talk about object orientation and what are its limits. So this is a very brief uh, recap. Uh, this is uh, supposed to be a recap of the previous lectures where we already talked about different strategies how to implement features, but also about object-oriented concepts. And then in the second and third part, we will see some extensions of object-oriented programming to enable some kind of features and their modularity. Feature-oriented programming is a bit special here because I did my PhD on this topic, and this is why I know all the advantages and all the disadvantages. Um, Feature-oriented programming has been uh, supported by our team uh, in terms of integrated development environment support in feature IDE uh, and aspect oriented programming was actually used in practice, uh, more used in practice uh, and had have had uh, in the past um, official uh, tool support and integrated development environments. So first, let's come to the limits of object orientation. We already talked about object orientation in the second lecture. Uh, we talked about key concepts of object orientation like encapsulation, composition, message passing, distribution of responsibility and inheritance. So these are all different uh, concepts that all together allow us to model a system in terms of its objects and these objects communicate with each other. And we will see that we go beyond the step in this uh, lecture, we will also see when are these objects, when is this message passing um, among objects not even enough in terms of modularization. We talked about design patterns already. We talked about design patterns uh, in general, but also with a special focus on variability. So how can we design systems in a way that uh, the variability is uh, supported, uh, that we kind of plan, pre-plan certain extensions uh, for the future and for instance if we want to uh, extend the way how objects are created of a certain kind then we can use for instance the abstract factory pattern to make the creation of objects exchangeable but we also looked at modularity on a higher level on a, a larger scale uh, in the last lecture when we looked at components services and frameworks so remember that we talked about components. Components are the classical way of modularization in software engineering. So we build components with a certain interface and a com component is typically much larger than a single class. Uh, it provides larger cohesion uh, and less coupling to other components than we would expect this from classes. But still, when combining those components, we need some glue code in order to create larger applications out of existing components. This is very similar for services, but for services, um, this composition is typically not called glue code, but there are different 
uh, kinds of uh, ways how to compose services. And these are a bit more structured, a bit more pre-planned uh, than uh, the more or less ad hoc reuse that we see with uh, components. And then we talked about frameworks and frameworks are kind of an advancement uh, of components where we don't need to write glue code for every application, for every product of the product line again, but we rather have some uh, the, the, the basic uh, glue code fitting all together is actually the main artifact. It's the framework and the framework has some predefined um, extension points and those extension points can then be later on provided uh, uh, means of plugins extended and uh, this overall gives us the functionality that we want. So we talked about these modularity concepts on object orientation, on design patterns, uh, but also on the level of components. And of course, these can be arbitrarily combined. Even if I'm using a frameworks with, uh, with plugins or components, I can still make use of object-oriented pro programming and of design patterns. And we looked at one example in the last lecture that illustrates how can we use uh, plugins in our graph product line in the uh, uh, implementation of graphs with variability, uh, which is our one example of the course. So I will not introduce it here, but the basic principles that a graph accesses um, so-called uh, graph plugins, which is basically an interface. This interface is implemented um, by a certain plugin, for instance, in this color, uh, in this example, the color plugin. And uh, on the other hand, um, yeah, then this kind of um, enables us to provide further extensions and we can not only have one of those, but rather a list of those plugins. So we could define other plugins fulfilling the same interface. And of course, while this is a bit hard to visualize on this uh, small scale example. In practice, we not only have one plugin uh, and one interface, but we have many interfaces, we have many plugins, and there's a end to end uh, relation of interfaces to plugins and also of uh, interfaces to uh, the framework. And because uh, uh, in most frameworks, plugins can itself extend the framework and provide further extension points. So what are the challenges? We already talked about challenges in our previous lecture at the, at the end when we talked about plugins in our discussion. So we've had this slide, we talked about, uh, there are many empty methods in the implementation. So it's very likely that we build an interface. There are many methods there and uh, we uh, don't need to extend all of them. This is not only a problem, uh, this is less a problem, let's say, let's say it like this, uh, in terms of uh, that we need to provide some additional code because of these empty methods, because we can always think of an abstract class, right? So looking again at this example, I could in the middle uh, here provide an abstract class and this abstract class simply provides all those uh, empty methods. Or in newer versions of Java, for instance, we can even uh, provide method implementations in terms of the interface. However, it is still a problem that many of these empty methods are actually called at runtime because the framework does not know uh, which of those plugins are needing uh, which functionality. So what it will do, it will iterate over all the possible parts. Uh, we've already seen this in the example. It will iterate over all the plugins and it will execute all the methods, uh, whether there's some code in there or not. So the general challenge that we face here is that of cross-cutting concerns. So we will talk about cross-cutting concerns in a minute in more detail, but basically we have plugins. These plugins want to extend something in the framework and what, what is one cause is that we can either have huge interfaces to connect, to be able to connect all our plugins to the framework, or we have lots of in, uh, uh, different interfaces, but then we have a lot of effort in terms of the framework because we need to handle all these different kinds of plugins 
um, and extensions. And the problem, another problem uh, with that is that of pre-planning. So given that we already know all our features in advance and we know how to implement them very well, then we can design a system in principle and theory, we can design a system in which all the extensions are simply possible. But in practice, and this is also where the agile movement comes from, uh, it's not easy to foresee all the changes. So would in our example would be able to foresee that colors and weights should be part of the, the plugin interface. Um, do we, uh, do we uh, know already that every plugin needs to be notified that the framework is about to print a node or an edge? So there's kind of some, even in the small example, we can see that some pre-planning is needed, that we need to find the right extension points and uh, to make our later extensions. And again, the agile uh, community would say, okay, just change the framework, right? You simply change the interfaces, you simply change uh, the design patterns used in those, uh, in the framework. But here the problem is that whenever we change interfaces of the uh, of the framework, then this will be hard for all the providers of plugins because if we add additional methods to an interface, then we will have, of course, the problem of incompatibilities with other plugins, existing plugins. So this is generally known as the pre-planning problem. We talked about this already in the last lecture. It's hard to identify and foresee all the relevant spots and uh, also the nature, uh, those hotspots and the nature of those extensions. So what what kind of um, extension points are needed to provide those extensions? So developing a framework overall needs a lot of expertise and excellent domain knowledge. And uh, we also see this uh, in very successful um, uh, frameworks like the Eclipse uh, integrated development environment, where at some point in time, people started to realize that we cannot always just add new things and make everything compatible uh, with all the uh, existing stuff. But they, at some point in time, they started, um, I think around uh, 2020, they started to also remove some of the functionality, they remove some um, uh, some parts of interfaces, make it incompatible on purpose with existing ones because it's hard to maintain such a system over a long time without actually changing interfaces in a way that it harms existing plugins. So this is known as a pre-planning problem and for components, services and frameworks, we have the problem that we need to find the right extension points, we need to find the right provided and required interfaces com for components and services. We need to find the right extension points for frameworks. And we need to kind of do this already before knowing all the possible extensions, right? When the maintainers uh, of and developers of the Eclipse IDE, they, they haven't envisioned all the possible use cases. Uh, they haven't envisioned that there will be a feature model editor and feature ID. But they have envisioned that there are different kinds of editors and different things that are needed, but not everything was possible. So for us as a uh, provider of a plugin uh, with Feature IDE, we, for instance, uh, run into the problem that we've had an extension of an existing editor, an editor for uh, something that is called Feature and Programming. We will talk about this in the next part of the lecture. And for this new editor, we wanted to simply change the title um, of the, the editor, uh, of the existing Java editor. But this was not foreseen, so this change was rather hard to accomplish for us uh, in terms of the existing extension points made available. So we can only do a modular extension for a certain feature, for a certain extension of the system that we are looking at, uh, the product line, if it was already pre-planned, if there's already a suitable extension point or interface, if the existing extension points or interfaces are not sufficient to make our extension, uh, then we cannot do it in a modular fashion because we also need to extend the framework, extend existing components, extend existing services in order to change their interfaces. And while this is the, the larger, the large scale view, we can also look 
doesn't object on the program provide a solution for us. Uh, I mean, we have subtyping, we have polymorphism uh, that allow ad hoc extension to some extent, right? Because uh, I don't need to say that for when defining a certain class that there can be subclasses at some point in time, but this is rather the default, right? I can always define subclasses and kind of change the behavior uh, of the uh, superclass. But often when providing new subclasses uh, and uh, overriding uh, methods by means of and using objects uh, by means of, uh, means of polymorphism, we often need to also adapt the client code. So it's not only sufficient to provide uh, a new subclass. For instance, uh, I have an edge and I have a directed edge and directed edge can be a subclass, but the subclass does actually need to be instantiated. And of course, we talked about this problem already when it comes to design patterns and how I can help. But then I need to pre-plan already in terms of an abstract factory pattern or something like this. I need to pre-plan that later on I want to extend um, the initialization of a certain class by means of subclasses or something else. And then when it comes to inheritance hierarchy, we have the problem that there's no mix and match. We cannot combine uh, subclasses in an arbitrary fashion because in most cases we will have a inheritance hierarchy and we can we cannot just remove something in the middle right so if you think of edges and we want to have directed and undirected edges and we want to have weighted and unweighted edges and if we do this by means of subclassing then we have the problem that we can hardly combine um, uh, subclasses uh, that are independent, somehow independent of each other. So again, if the extension that we are about to make to the product line, to the product, uh, is not envisioned and is not possible by means of those extension points, then we are, uh, yeah, then we are losing modularity because we cannot do this in a modular fashion. So again, what are cross-cutting concerns? Uh, cross-cutting concerns, uh, we will do this in two steps. First, what is a concern? A concern is an area of interest or focus in a system and features are the concerns of primary interest and product line engineering, right? So we can think of there are certain requirements to the system. There are concerns which are uh, yeah, kind of certain requirements in the system, uh, might be groups of requirements, uh, but then we have these special notion of features which are, uh, which are a special kind of concern. And uh, we kind of want to modularize these concerns, these features. So what are cross-cutting concern? Cross-cutting is the structural relationship between the representation of two concerns it is an alternative to hierarchical or block structure. So this means we kind of, we have some structure in our system, but it, uh, to, to some degree, at least, there is an existing modularization, but something cross cuts our existing modularization. And we will see this in more detail in a minute. And what is the problem here is, with those cross-cutting concerns uh, is best described by means of the tyranny of the dominant decomposition. I'm sorry for this uh, term. It's, I promise, that's the most complicated term that you will see in this whole uh, lecture series. Um, but actually, it's not that complicated. So the idea is many of the concerns that we see in product lines, but also in single systems can be modularized. But the problem is that they cannot be modularized at the same time. So developers make a choice when they uh, uh, design their system, uh, when they design the architecture, but also uh, on a smaller scale, um, the uh, design of classes and how classes interact with each other. Um, then they make a choice and they decompose their system in a certain way. And, but then other concerns, so some concerns are kind of dominant and they are decomposed and others are then cross-cutting to these others. And this means the simultaneous modularization along different dimensions is not possible. 
right? And this is kind of uh, what we talk about here is that we can modulize something into classes, but we have multiple dimensions in practice and there are several dimensions that kind of cross cut to each other. And we need to make a distinction or a decision along which you will want to do the, um, the modularization. So let's uh, talk about some rather abstract example that you've probably used already in, in source code, for instance, uh, logging, right? So if we want to uh, understand how our system uh, is executed, then we might want to see um, each time when a certain method is called from a given library, maybe only public methods, um, then uh, we might want to have some logging that gives us information about when was the um, um, uh, a certain library, for instance, for encryption, when was it called, uh, was a certain uh, yeah, method always called bef before the other one or something like this. Then we have caching and pooling. So this is uh, a common uh, idea in, in computer science that we uh, have certain pool of working threads, for instance, or a pool of resources. And whenever we want to do something, we just check, is something uh, available in the pool? Are some resources available right now? Then I will use those. And if they're not available right now, then I'm in a queue and I will be executed or uh, the, whatever is uh, uh, the pool is handling uh, will be done then later on or caching is something similar. And this could, for instance, happen whenever an object is created. So we would need, in order to make such an extension, uh, we want to introduce pooling, caching into an existing application. We would need to identify every position where an object is created, and then we would need to replace that. And then there are other examples with synchronization or locking, where we have many extensions uh, or need to extend many methods with some lock, unlock calls, for instance. And the thing is, why do we discuss cross-cutting concerns in such a detail in this lecture? Uh, cross-cutting concerns are a, a general thing in, uh, in, uh, in, in any software system, but in product lines, there are uh, especially a problem because features are often cross-cutting to each other, and we will see some examples in a minute. We already looked at a running example, but we will use another example here, which is the classical example to introduce cross-cutting concerns. What we want to do is we want to have arithmetic expressions. So these arithmetic expressions are, uh, can be written in infix notation, which is something like this. So we have this expression over here where we have five plus the uh, logarithmic function of 50, then we compute this and then multiply this by 1.73. So while this is can be considered just as a string, it's more practical for us in computer science to consider those expressions in terms of a tree structure. And this is what compiler construction can do for us. Uh, there are many algorithms for this that can produce such um, such a tree structure out of this um, out of this uh, formula over here. So, for instance, we have the multiplication over here. Uh, we have the plus over here, and we have the logarithmic function over here. And what we can already see is from this example, there's no need to uh, think about brackets in this tree structure because the brackets are already somehow encoded into the hierarchy. So in this example, we will look at these tree structures. We will uh, model uh, those our, uh, our rhythmic expressions as tree structures. And then we have certain uh, terms over there, and they can be evaluated or they can be printed. And these are certain operations that we can have on the existing data. And the main question is now how to separate data structures and operations such that both can be extended independent of, of each other. So what do we want to do? We want to be able to introduce a modulo, oper, uh, a modulo um, 
a term which is an extension of the data type because we can have more uh, different uh, data types uh, if we also introduce the modulo operation and at the same time we might want to have a new a version of printing that is able to um, yeah, uh, avoid some of the unnecessary brackets and not introduce brackets whenever um, a new expression, a sub-expression is, is printed out. So when it comes to the tyranny of the dominant decomposition, uh, we have two options here, two main options, how to modularize our system. So the first variant is considered the data-centric decomposition. We have a recursive uh, class structure. Uh, you can uh, uh, think of this as a composite pattern, the design pattern. And for each operation, evil, print, and so on, there's a dedicated method in each class. So we have certain classes here. We have the classes uh, for number. We have the classes for plus operation, product, and for logarithmic function. and these are all classes of a certain interface of the interface of terms. And in this example, it will be rather simple to introduce a, a modular operation because all we need to do is provide another class over here in this hierarchy, which also fulfills this interface um, uh, of the term. And this is what is known in the composite pattern is that we can introduce new uh, elements into the structures, primitive or compound statements. And you will see that in terms of the terminology of the composite pattern, that number is a primitive uh, type here and plus product and logarithmic function are compound uh, elements. So why it's easy to add these new um, uh, these new uh, data types that we can have in our expressions, like the modular function, it's not that easy to add something like draw tree, right? So we might want to be able to draw the tree that we've seen on the previous slide uh, instead of just having a texture rendered version of um, uh, the expression. In this case, we not only need to change the interface and introduce a new method here, uh, but we also need to change every single implementation of the interface in order to say how to draw a tree out of this uh, expression. So what we can see is that the operations cross-cut uh, the, uh, the expressions and we, we uh, see that, um, uh, for instance, the evil method is uh, written over here and it's not really modular, it's cross-cutting to the existing decomposition. But there's another variant, how to decompose the system. So now we choose another dominant decomposition and this time we do it operation-centric. So the idea is we have just a single except method per every class. Uh, which is uh, similar to the visitor pattern and each operation is implemented by a dedicated visitor. So we, when we look at this, we have the following. We have the visitor interface and we have the print visitor, uh, which basically prints out a string of our expression. And we have the evil uh, visitor, which can evaluate our expression. And in this example, it will be rather simple to just add a new operation here that says draw three. I would just write draw over here. And this will be rather simple because all we need to do is to add this to our existing visitor interface. So that's what the, the visitor pattern, what it has in mind, that we can, we can simply add new visitors to these methods and these methods uh, or to existing uh, classes. And all the, that the data types, the classes need to do is to say, accept visitor, accept visitor, accept visitor. So uh, providing these methods and then uh, the actual visitors will do the job. However, this is again a dominant decomposition of operations. But when we whenever we want to introduce a new data type into our expressions, then this is not modular. And this is not, not easy to see from the picture, but imagine we would add a new class over here. Of course, we can somehow add this. 
But the problem is, that's not all we need to do, because we also need to extend every single visitor uh, whenever it comes to a new operation where we uh, visit uh, then the, for instance, modulo operation. So what we see is that expressions cross-cut these operations and we can either use the data-centric or the operation-centric, but we cannot modularize both at the same time. So what are the lessons learned from this uh, very simple example that easily fits on the slide, but is kind of representative of what happens in a large scale? It's hardly possible to modularize expressions and operations at the same time. So we've seen with this two implementation uh, variants that it's possible to modularize expressions. It's possible to modularize uh, 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 operations, but it's infeasible to model, modularize both at the same time by means of object-oriented concepts, by means of uh, design patterns. So the data-centric decomposition allows new expressions um, can be added directly. So this is modular, but the new operations must be added to all classes, which is inherently not modular. And we have the operation-centric decomposition, where new operations can be added as another visitor. So this is modular. But for new expressions, all existing visitors um, must be extended. So this is not modular. So what are the limits of object orientation? We looked at important problems of all the previous implementation techniques for software product lines. For instance, we have inflexible inheritance hierarchies, especially with one-term variability frameworks, components, and services. Uh, we don't have this for, um, uh, for preprocessors, for instance. Uh, but for preprocessors, we have another problem. We have that of feature traceability. So when it comes to the fact that I want to identify all the possible, all the implementations of a certain feature. Then we have talked a lot about the pre-planning problem. We kind of, we need to envision what are the possible extensions in the future, and we need to provide the right extension points for those extensions. And this is especially a problem with frameworks, components, and services. And we have cross-cutting issues. So issues with cross-cutting concerns, especially also with those techniques that suffer from the pre-planning problem. So something that you could do now to think about this in a bit more detail, we talked a lot about the graph product line. So when you look again at the previous examples, and you can access the slides uh, by clicking in the, uh, on the link in the description, uh, you can look at the old slides where we, we've seen the graph implementation. What is the dominant decomposition? Uh, what are cross-cutting concerns regarding this uh, decomposition that we've looked at in the uh, existing examples? And how can, could we restructure the implementation to come up with a different composition that something else is, uh, is uh, yeah, modular? Uh, but then uh, you might also want to think about this more critical. What can then not be uh, decomposed at the same time because of the tyranny of the dominant decomposition? Thanks for your interest in this lecture and hope to see you again in the next part.